Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. But I encourage you to take your Bibles, go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, I was uh, sharing during Sunday school, and Pastor wasn't here during Sunday school, but I was praying last night after I sent him the lesson for Sunday school this morning, and uh, if you weren't here during Sunday school, we did the uh, character and the construction program. I taught one of those lessons so that that way you could see what that looks like, see that in action. Uh, now, it got a little more churchy than what I'm, I try to be whenever I'm teaching one of them uh, because we're in church, right? Uh, so we went a little more churchy with that, but you saw, got to see that in action. I was telling the people that was here during Sunday school this morning, I'm amazed at how well God puts things together. Because whenever I went, when I started praying last night, my kids was in the bed, my wife was laying there in the bed, they was all asleep. I was sitting there in front of the laptop doing some stuff, just praying and asked the Lord what he'd have me to preach this morning. And this passage came to my mind, and I'm thinking, Lord, that's not a Sunday morning message. And I just mean, it's not, okay? If you came looking for a hoot, hollering, shouting message, you came to the wrong place this morning, okay? But I want to give you my heart, and I want to try to help you this morning from the Word of God. This message is, um, if I can say it this way, and I think the preachers in the room will understand what I'm supposed to say, this message is difficult for me to preach because it brings up a lot of memories, a lot of memories. How many of y'all have been hurt before? How many of y'all been hurt in church before? How many of y'all been hurt in the world before? You know what I'm figuring out? All of us have got those things. And what I'm figuring out, the more and more that I'm in this thing, is that we all have problems that we have to deal with on a regular basis. And Paul in our text this morning is no different than you and I. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, as I study the Word of God, I find that Paul is just a man, but he's God's man. And he even makes the statement, he says, follow me, and he said, just in case you're, con just in case you're confused, I want you to follow me as I follow Christ. Now, can I say this this morning? I'm not here to follow a man. I'm here to follow the man. Now, I have no issue following. I have a pastor. I have no issue following as long as he's following Christ. That's, that's the requirement. And when someone stops following Christ, that's when we need to stop following them. Right? But the thing that we fail to realize sometimes is that people are following us as we follow Christ. I was down in D.C. this week, and I, I'm going to get in the text here in just a second, but I was down in D.C. this week, and I, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't, we had some, we had one good meeting. We have four representatives in New Hampshire and went down for Capital Connection, and we have four representatives in New Hampshire, and out of the four, only one of them, or only one of them didn't allow us to set up a meeting with somebody. But when we went into that one, we just dropped in, and when we walked in, the receptionist asked us, she said, uh, can I help you or not? We, Brother Peter, our assistant pastor, was with me, and he said, yeah, he said, we're here for this, and he told her what we was doing. And he, he made this statement, and you could almost see the demeanor change on her face. He said, not only are we here to present the senator with this, but we're also here just to pray for you. And when he said that, the look that came over her face was almost, I don't even know. And whenever I, you understand what I mean when I say we got ushered out of that office quickly? And here's the thing, the whole thing, you've, I'm sure y'all have heard the song, Do They See Jesus in Me? Do they recognize His face? When we walked out of that office, in my mind, I thought, uh, I know what I can tell you. In my mind. I didn't say it. But then right behind it, 
that they see Jesus in you. Now here's the goal of the Christian life is to win sinners, right? That's the one job we have as believers. Y'all understand that? But how are we going to win them? They got to see Jesus in us. Because you can walk up to somebody, and I'm, I've walked up to somebody, hey, can I give you a gospel track, talk to you about Jesus? And they take my gospel track and they listen to what I got to say. And that's as far as it goes. But then I've talked to those people that I've been around for a little while, and I've built a relationship with them, and I've went to the Dunkin' Donuts, and I've paid for their coffee, and we've went to the Red Arrow, and I've paid for their meals. So, Brother Matthew, you pay for a lot of stuff. I do. But you know what? It's so worth it whenever they look at me and say, there's something different about you. And as we're trying to be different, guess what's going to come up? There's going to be thorns that come in our lives. And I want to read to you from the Word of God this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. I want to give you read ten verses of scripture in your hearing. Normally, I would have you stand, but I want to, I want to just work my way through this text if I can this morning. In Second Corinthians chapter number twelve, the Bible says, in the beginning in verse number one, it is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. In other words, it's not beneficial for him. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago. Whether in the body or out of the, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one called up to the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was called up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself will I, I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say to the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should stop and think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Verse number 7 says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the th revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Did you catch that? Two different times in the same verse, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse number 8, he goes on to say, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made, perf for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul comes back and says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reading of your word this morning. Lord, I pray that you give me clarity of thought, clarity of mind. Lord, you'd help me to preach what thus saith the Lord this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help me not to do or say anything that will grieve or quench your Holy Spirit this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to do and say everything that you want said and done for your honor and your glory. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you. Give me the words to say. Put a watch care about my mouth. Lord, help us not to leave here the same way we came in. Oh, Lord, help us to leave here being challenged by the Word of God and changed by the Spirit of God. Help us, I pray. Well, thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Help me to preach this morning like I've never preached before. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In this passage of Scripture, Paul is talking about two of the greatest experiences he ever had outside of his conversion on the Damascus Road. He talks about the first experience in verse number 1 down through verse number 6, and then he talks about the second one in verse number 7 down through verse number 10, our text that we've read this morning. The first experience that he had was a heavenly experience. The second one was a humbling experience. The, second, the first experience was a pleasant experience. Who wouldn't want to ascend into paradise and see things that's not lawful to be uttered? Who wouldn't want that experience? 
But the second one, the one that nobody wants, is a painful experience. The first experience was a spiritual experience. The second one was a physical experience. The first one was one that involved the eternal world. The second one was one that involved the earthly world. The first one was one that he could not fully remember. He says, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. He said, I don't remember. But the second one's one he never forgot. The first one was one that lasted but for a moment. The second one was one that lasted for a lifetime. The first one was one that could not be shared. The second one was the one that could not be seen. The first one was one that was carried out by God. The second one was carried out by Satan. The first one was minimized in the Scriptures, but the second one was magnified in the Scriptures. We're not told what Paul saw or what Paul saw when he ascended. We're not told what happened. We're not even told how many... uh, visions and revelations that Paul had, although we know he had multiple. But those are minimized in Scripture. They're not magnified in Scripture. And we see, I wrote this down, although Paul would be completely justified in boasting in his amazing experiences, he forgoes doing so and boasts rather in his weaknesses. Now, none of us want to do that. None of us want to admit where we're weak at, do we? we that, and you say, well, Brother Matthew, why is that? Because we're, we're human. And humans are naturally prideful people. One of the reasons why that you woke up this morning and you, I hope you did, at least in the last 24 hours, took a shower and hopefully you brushed your teeth. And if you have hair, you combed your hair and you got dressed and you made sure your clothes was ironed and your shoes were shined and... You did all those things. Why did you do that? You have pride in your appearance. There's a reason why that I made sure this morning that I took the shoe brush that I brought with me and knocked any dust off my shoes. Here's the thing. You get one chance to make a first impression. And at the end of the day, Paul could have been completely justified in magnifying his experience. Rather, instead of magnifying those things, he exalted his weaknesses. By doing this, Paul ensured that, and I love this statement, by doing this, Paul ensured that authority in the church would not be based on an ecstatic experience, but rather on the actions and words of the leaders. See, my Christian life is not based on how I feel. My Christian life is based on this book. If your Christian life this morning is based on anything other than the Word of God, I promise you, you're going to be severely disappointed. Because you know what? Even though they don't want to, people in leadership, guess what they're going to do? They're going to disappoint you. They're going to fail you. And even though you say, well, Brother Matthew, you know, I really look up to them. Well, here's the thing. I've always said it this, I've always heard it said this way. Instead of putting your pastor on a pedestal where he can fall, put him on your prayer list. Because at the end of the day, if you'll pray for him, guess what? He might fail and he might come short, but guess what? He'll keep going. Instead of putting him on a pedestal, and then guess what happens? When he falls, guess what you do? You fall. Paul didn't magnify his experience, but rather focused on his weakness. Paul forbids any assessment of himself and his ministry by standards other than his actions and his words. This provides essential wisdom for navigating the currents of the modern church. We must understand that regardless of how great a personal claim is to visions and ecstasies, nothing can replace conduct and speech as an indication of truly following Christ. Paul didn't brag about his visions and his revelations. Why? Because he knew they couldn't be proven. I struggle, if if I'm being honest, I struggle with men and women that they want to boast in their experiences, but they don't want to boast in Christ. 
my identity. Paul talks about it in Ephesians chapter number two. He talks about our past identity, our pressed, our present identity, and our future identity. And I can't get sidetracked there because I love the book of Ephesians. But Paul says, my identity is not me. It's Christ. He said, I used to be a dead man, but now I'm alive forevermore. He said, and such were some of you. Now you're washed, you're sanctified, you've been justified. How? By the blood of Christ. We see this matter of the thorns this morning. I want to just look at this thought this morning on the purpose of the thorns. If you're, list, if you're taking notes this morning, if you are, you're going to have to listen fast because we're going to go through this fast, all right? But I want to deal with this thought this morning, the purpose of the thorns. Why? I began looking recently and I was... I preached this message probably about 10 years ago and the Lord put it on my heart recently and I pulled it back out and you know how it is as a preacher, you pull it back out and you're like, man, I don't remember what I was trying to say there. I really hope the people knew what I was trying to say there. So I pulled it back out and I started studying over it and I made some changes and things of that nature. But one of the things I did was I, I looked up what thorn, what is the purpose of thorns? Or what purpose, when you get that rose, why is there thorns on that thing? Well, I did find this out last night that the thorns that are on rose bushes are not actually thorns, but rather they're called prickles because they're softer than actual thorns. Y'all ever stuck yourself with a rose bush thorn? Feels pretty hard to me, don't it, you? When it causes your finger to bleed or whatever, it's pretty hard, right? But I read this last night, and even again this morning, I woke up this morning about five o'clock and I. As much as I was trying my best to, I tried to lay there for 30 minutes and go back to sleep, and I just couldn't. So I got up and I said, well, let's find out some more about thorns. And here's what I found out about thorns is this. Sometimes they're called thorns, sometimes they're called prickles, sometimes they're called spines, but they were created with one purpose in mind, and it's to protect. To protect. Now... If I'm being honest, I don't think of protection when I think of thorns. I think of pain. I think of heartache. But the thorns were created by our Heavenly Father to protect that plant that they're on. Even in Paul's life, we can see that there's protection in the thorns. Let me give you this real quickly. Whether it be from the herbivores, that's the plant-eating animals, that would eat up the plant, or whether from the elements, the heat and the cold, they do have a purpose in being there. And can I tell you this morning, they have a purpose in our lives as well. And Paul, God allowed Paul to suffer affliction for four different reasons. I'm going to give them to you quickly and I'll be done. Number one, he allowed Paul to suffer affliction. Number one, to destroy pride in his life. Look at what he said in verse number 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. So obviously it's not just one. You don't say abundance even about three. If you say you have an abundance of things, that means you have a lot of them. Is everybody understanding that? So he said, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh the messenger of Satan to buffet me. That word buffet, it's not buffet. It means buffet. And it literally, the word picture there, the, the meaning behind it is literally, what is Paul saying? He said, the messenger of Satan gave me a thorn. And he was to buffet me. There's argument, all, and if, depending on which commentary you pick up, you're going to find, if you pick up 10 different commentaries, you're going to find 10 different answers about what this thorn was. But you know what I find in this text, based on the fact that Paul didn't elaborate on it? I believe the Corinthian church knew exactly what it was. And he didn't feel the need under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to make mention of it because they already knew what it was. But when we look at this this morning, he talks about the fact, lest I should be exalted above measure. You know what I've figured out in my Christian life? Before God can use something, you know what He has to do? He has to break it. You know what Paul, 
Paul's already been used greatly by God at this point. Do you know what? God's just saying, hey, I'm going to break you down even further. The Marine Corps, they tell me in the Marine Corps, I've never been in the Marine Corps, I have no desire to be in the Marine Corps, if I'm being honest. Paris Island would scare the willies out of me, and I don't know if you're supposed to say that. Forgive me if I'm not, all right? <sighs> just in the mood today, apparently. But you know what? I have no desire, but they tell me that one of the purposes of Paris Island is to break a person down as far as they can break them and then build them back into the soldier, into the Marine that they want them to be. What is the Marine's motto? The few, the proud, the chosen. Because there's a lot of people that go in, there's a lot of people that's crazy enough to go in. There ain't a lot of them makes it through boot camp. Why? Because they literally do that very thing. What are they doing? They're breaking them. Paul said, God's trying to destroy pride in my life. He said, Brother Matthew, what are you, you going to If Paul struggled with pride, and he's much more of a man of God than what I'll ever be, you know what that tells me? It tells me I'm going to struggle with pride. It tells me you're going to struggle with pride. It's to destroy pride in his life. It made him disabled. It humbled him. It made him dependent. He needed God now more than ever before. Why? Because in according to verse number 7, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me. Here's the thing. This thorn, I, may, I misspoke earlier. This thorn wasn't given to him by Satan. It was given to him by God. For a purpose. It was a messenger of Satan. That literally means an angel of Satan. If I understand my, if I understand my Bible correctly and I understand the study of the Word of God that I've done, that means it was an angel of Satan to buffet him. Now what this thorn was, I have no idea, but all I know is this. It humbled him. There's authors that, one author made the, in this I'm, I don't have a dog in the race. I, it's not a hill I'm willing to die on, right? But one author did make a good argument. He said it's possible that it wasn't something necessarily in his flesh, but rather in his mind. I don't know. But you know what I do know? It humbled him. And it says that it humbled him. It made him dependent. He needed God more. Now, the Lord allowed Paul's intense suffering to impale his otherwise proud flesh to humble the one who had so many revelations. You ever run into that person that if you've done it, they've done it and so much better? You know what I want to... Y'all forgive me, this is petty as all get out, okay? So because I've told you that ahead of time, I'm going to go ahead and say it, alright? But you know what? I love being around whenever people like that get humbled. I love it. Because I'm like, how's that crow taste, big boy? Okay? You know what I figured out about crow? It's best served warm and with mustard. Now why? Because I'd rather eat it while it's hot and go ahead and apologize for wrongdoing right away instead of having to deal with it months down the road. You know what Paul said? He said it was to humble me. Not only did it make him disabled, it made him dependent, it made him determined. Look at what he said in verse number 7, the last part. Lest I should be exalted above me. You know what Paul realized? He realized there was a purpose to it. And he realized, you know what? I need this if I'm going to go on. And we'll look down through there. And he says, listen, I'm not willing to quit. I'm not willing to stop what God has me doing. So if this is something that I have to deal with, then so be it. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather jo joy in my infirmities, rather glory, excuse me, in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest on. You say, Brother Matthew, what's he doing? He's saying, you know what, I'm moving on. I'm not dwelling on this. We see the purpose of the thorns, number one, is to destroy pride. Number two, is to develop prayer. Look at what he does in verse number eight. The Bible says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, 
that it might depart from me. We see number one is agony. The Bible says he besought the Lord. The word besought means to urge, to implore, to exhort. You know what he's saying? He's literally begging God, God, would you take this away from me? You know what God says? No. You know what Paul said? Okay. But it doesn't change the fact he's in agony. Just because Paul and just because you and I accept the answer doesn't change the pain. But you know what it does do? It gives grace to be able to handle the pain. We see his agony. We see not just his agony, we see his asking. Look at what the Bible said. For this thing I besought the Lord three or thrice, three times. Where do you think he learned that from? Is it possible he was following the example of Christ as he prayed in the garden? Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thy will. The very Son of God is praying that in his flesh. As he was 100% God, but 100% man at the same time. And in his flesh, he said, God, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not, at thy, not my will, but thy will. We see his asking. We see not only his asking, but we see his answer. We see the Lord's answer. Verse number 9, he said, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for me, for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. We see, say, just because the Lord did not remove it does not mean He didn't answer. Rather, this affliction drove Him to His knees. Suffering is a tool God uses in our lives to build character. He must break us in order to bless us. No, God did not remove Paul's pain. This did not mean that He didn't answer Paul's prayer. The answer was simply different from what the apostle had asked for. You ever prayed some prayers and preacher? I, I don't know about you, but I pastored for a couple of years, and those two years was I was all set on that one. I'm happy where I'm at. That's not to say God won't change my heart 30 years from now when I'm old and decrepit. I don't mean that if you're 68 years old, you're old and decrepit. All right, let's. <laughs> sorry, remember that whole. But you know what? Those two years, preacher, I prayed God get them out of here. And God didn't get them out of there. And in those two years, y'all, y'all forgive me, okay? I prayed some David prayers. You say, preacher, what's the David prayers? You go back and look at the book of Psalms and you'll find out what, the, what David's prayers were. You say, brother Matthew, you prayed the... Oh, yeah. Was I in the flesh when I did it? Probably. But I'd had about all I could handle. You know what they were? They were a thorn in my side. You know what I really truly believe about them? Because they showed up after I got there. I believe the devil personally sent them to distract from what was going on. He said, Brother Matt, I don't believe it. Well, that's fine. Do you know what? He answered. Can you tell you how many times that this verse thundered in my mind? My grace is sufficient for thee. See, can I can I go behind the scenes of ministry for just a second? Is that okay? I want to be very transparent for just, and I'm even going to come down. Please don't get nervous. I don't know how you preach, but can I be honest with you? Very transparent. Ministry is one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. But it's also the most joyous thing I've ever done in my life. So preacher, why? Because people, most people, don't get it. Preacher, you helped me last night. You really helped me last night. Even before starting in missions, when I took my first church preacher, I thought I had all the answers. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> but 
But I can tell you this this morning. I have no. I could stand here and tell you stories. Not going to because you know what that does. That honors and glorifies the devil. It doesn't honor and glorify the Lord. Do you know what I can tell you? Through it all, God's been faithful. Amen. Through it all, He's been there every step of the way. Amen. Through it all, I mean through every bit of it. Paul said it this way over in 2 Timothy. I forget the reference. I think it's 2.11, somewhere right in there. He said persecutions, and he names off several different things. But it comes, he endured at Lystra, I think it was, but he comes down to the end of the verse, and he said, but out of them all, God delivered me. You said, preacher, this storm, this thorn, feels like it's about to kill me. Can I tell you, upon the authority of the Word of God this morning, He will deliver he might not deliver the way that you and I think He ought to, but He will deliver. It's to destroy pride. It's to develop prayer. Number three, quickly, it's to demonstrate power in Paul's life. Whose power? Not Paul's power, but God's power. He said there in verse number 9, He said, and He said unto me, talking about God, He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. We see the power of grace that's being exhibited. God's showing him a new chapter in the grace of God. I wrote this statement down. I forget who, who said it, but I wrote this statement down. If God's Word does not have all the answers to life's problems, how can it be perfect, able to transform the soul? Now, don't misunderstand me this morning. I'm not against medicine if it's truly needed. I'm not against any of that. Matter of fact, truthfully, I think some people for years, and Pastor, you've probably grown up in the same areas and same things I've heard, for years, it was preached against. I can't find that in Scripture. But what I can find is this. Sometimes we run to the doctor instead of running to the great physician. Sometimes we run to the counselor instead of the counselor. Sometimes we run to what the world has instead of running to what God has. Please don't misunderstand me at this point. I'm not against medicine. But when's the last time that you and I said, you know what, this problem feels like it's about to kill me. And instead of talking to everybody else about it, we told Him about it. I was at a gas station, shocker. I was at a gas station the other day and when you put 40,000 miles a year on your vehicle, you, you visit a lot of gas stations, okay? But I was at a gas station the other day, and uh, I forget even where I was, but the, you know they've got that gas station TV now, you know, because we have to be constantly entertained, right? And this YouTube, I don't even know how we got to a YouTube influencer, but this YouTube influencer was on there, and he was talking about this young girl that she had uh, done something great, and they had given her some kind of big prize and a video game system and all this stuff. And then as an afterthought, he added in, oh, and they gave her a journal. And I was like, well, that's, that's unusual. And he said, a journal, and it, it offended me when he said it because I use one. He said, a journal is something old people use to process their feelings. And I'm just being honest, that irritated me. And I said it out loud to him. He couldn't hear a word I was saying. But I said it out loud. I said, yeah, young people have one too. Theirs is just called social media. When's the last time you told God about it? Instead of telling everybody else about it. We see the power of grace in his life. I wrote this now. Was Paul mistaken whenever he wrote 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man, be, man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's the Bible we have. So, preacher, are you telling me that the Christian life ain't always easy? I'm glad you figured that out. You know what the, the, the Christian life, you know what it is? It is a bed of roses. Because with the roses, guess what comes? 
those thorns. Do you know what? Through it all, He's faithful. We see not only this power of grace, but let me give you this quickly. I'm going to skip some of this stuff. The power of gladness in verse number 9. He said, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmity. How is He doing that? He's doing it with the Lord's help. He's not doing it in and of Himself. Here's the thing. That grace is sufficient. I looked up that word sufficient. And I will give you this. I'm going to back up and give you this. That word sufficient, it means that it will be more than enough. There's more than enough to go around. For you, for me, for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's ever walked upon the face of the earth, there is more than enough grace. It is sufficient. Why? Because it's God's grace. My grace, can I be honest with you, my grace will run out. And at times it has. But His has never ran out. You see, the power of gladness, because strength is made perfect in weakness, it was necessary for the fires of affliction to burn away the pride, the dross of pride and self-confidence. He feels no repentance here in boasting, no sense of playing the fool. His shyness has evaporated. Paul boasts most gladly, therefore, with total enthusiasm. Now, here's the thing. I'll be honest. James chapter 1, I mentioned in Sunday school this morning. James 1, verse number 2. Count it, my brethren. He's talking to saved people, right? My brethren, count it all what? Joy. And then he had to go in, add those next three, or next four, five words. When you fall into divers' temptations. You know what he's saying? When trials come, count it all joy. And here's the thing, when you count it all joy, that doesn't mean that you're walking around with your lip dragging the ground. That means you're still excited about the fact that He's on the throne. That means you're still rejoicing in the fact that you and I have an eternal home in heaven. That means you and I are still rejoicing in the fact that He's still God and beside Him there is none else. We see the power of gladness. Number three, we see the power of God. That word uh, strength there in verse number... Verse number 9, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's the Greek word dynamis or dunamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite or dynamo. It literally it describes the ability to perform an activity by extension. It refers to someone in the position of power or the force of a person's action. This word is commonly used in Scripture to indicate God's unlimited power. So preacher, he don't have enough for me. I beg to differ. I got Bible saying he does. He said, Preacher, you don't know what my problem is. I sure don't. But I do know this. He's got it. Hey, we see not only it's to destroy pride, to develop a prayer life, to de- demonstrate power, but number four, and I'm done quickly, is to determine pleasure in his life. Number one, we see what he took pleasure in. We see he took in pleasure in his infirmities. That was his sickness. He took pleasure in his pain. He took pleasure in his provocation. That's the reproaches, the insults. Not only that, in his distresses, in the necessities, he took, pos- he took pleasure in his pain and even in possible poverty, in persecutions, in the affliction of pain, punishment, or death upon others justly. He took pleasure in those things. When's the last time you took pleasure in any of that? Can I be honest? I hate being sick. And this time of year is murder on me. Because spring can't decide whether it wants to sprung or whether it wants to go back into hiding and winter come back. So you know what stuff starts doing? It starts growing and then it dies. It starts growing and then it dies. It starts growing and then it dies. And that just kills me. I go down south and it's even worse. I'm going down south in a couple weeks and I've already... Y'all, don't, if there's a doctor or a nurse in the building, please don't come to me after service, Okay. But I've already started taking two allergy pills a day in preparation because it's pollen season down there. And I don't know about you, I don't like pollen season and my allergies don't like pollen season. But can I be honest with you, it's hard for me to rejoice in that. You know what Paul said? I've been rejoicing every bit of it. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. We see not only His reproaches or his infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses. Abraham Lincoln once said, we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or we can rejoice because thorn thorn bushes have roses. 
We can rejoice or we can complain because rose bushes have thorns or we can rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. We see what he took ple- we see what he took pleasure in, we see who he took pleasure in for Christ's sake. And lastly, we see why he took pleasure. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Isaac Watts made this or wrote this down. He said, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, saving the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Can I ask you a question this morning? The preacher's facing calm. We're going to close. I've preached one minute longer than I intended to. Can I ask you a question? What's your perspective of your thorns? This story is told of a young girl. She's laying there at her grandmother's feet and her grandmother's doing some needlework. And she's looking at it from the bottom. And if you've ever seen somebody do embroidery, needlework, that type of deal, the backside don't look that great. And she looked at her grandma and she said, Grandma, what in the world are you doing? You're messing that all up. She said, it looks horrible. And her grandma realized what was going on. She said, no, honey, come here. She showed her the top of it. See, what you and I oftentimes don't realize is we're seeing the bottom side of it. God's got a plan. God has a purpose. Every single thing that you and I go through. What is is your perspective this morning? How do you feel about your thorn? How do I feel about my thorn? I'll be honest with you. Lord's really challenged my heart over the last two to three weeks to be thankful for my thorns. It's not always easy. Matter of fact, there are some things that I'm still asking, Lord, Lord, please help me be thankful for that. But you know what? Every step of the way, He's faithful. And I have to trust that He has a plan in what He's allowing to take place in my life and what He's giving in my life. The purpose of the thorns is to, develop, is to destroy pride, develop prayer, demonstrate power, but then to demonstrate joy. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.